Good morning, everyone. I'm going to welcome everyone to the President's Day edition of uh, our Grand Rounds this morning. So I welcome everyone. And I'd like to call attention to the fact that we are open for in-person um, visits now for Grand Rounds with 30 people, although I don't think anyone's taking attendance, so we <laughs> be pretty loose about that. And uh, I'd like to thank Laura Elm from Pfizer and Eric Storhoff and Kim Schmidt from Novartis for supporting Grand Rounds this morning. This morning, I hope everyone's sodium channels are up and running because we have a great presentation from the uh, newest member of the MHIF Science Center, the Heart Rhythm Science Center, led by Jason Gupta with Bob Hauser uh, also lending his support. I think um, there are three pillars that Jay mentioned as his focus of the Heart Rhythm Science Center. Those are uh, the genetic arrhythmia and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies, uh, atrial fibrillation with the work of Dan Melby and uh, meticulous mapping, and then uh, device safety and uh, optimization with Bob Hauser and Alan Bank. I will point out before I introduce uh, Jay that the Genetic Arrhythmia Clinic was started back in 09, I think, uh, 11 years ago, and uh, has now over 400 patients. And I, I think that's important because we heard from Perry Elliott earlier, his grand rounds, about the importance of uh, genetics in cardiomyopathies, dilated cardiomyopathies and others. And, Obviously, uh, the Heart Rhythm Science Center was on to this 12 years ago now, so um, nice to see that history. So welcome up, up Jay, and I'm going to hand it over to you, and then uh, you and Bob can enlighten us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharkey. That was uh, fantastic. And yeah, um, the Genetic Arrhythmia Center is a uh, Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation endeavor, which is uh, fantastic, uh, Dr. Katsianis. Uh, and then Dr. Abdahadi have done tremendous work uh, with that center, and now we have this tremendous registry, so appreciate that. It's, it's really an honor to be here with all of you and uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Hauser and sharing this stage. And uh, uh, over the next few minutes, uh, uh, an hour or so, we'll try to um, introduce the Heart Rhythm Science Center to you, the design and development, and talk about uh, some critical research that we've been doing uh, within the center, and specifically focusing on the uh, device safety and an innovation pillar uh, that, that Dr. Sharkey mentioned. So I have uh, no disclosures. Um, the vision is very simple. is It's to advance the diagnosis and treatment of heart rhythm disorders worldwide. And uh, it's something that uh, is needed and something that we're uniquely capable of doing at, at Minneapolis Heart Institute, which is uh, what makes this um, center of excellence very special. And uh, the, the way this kind of came about early on is uh, Dr. Gornick uh, had a, uh, a wonderful patient who, who loves and values him so much, they, they made a, a very generous contribution in his name. And um, the question was whether to apply that to a specific project or um, uh, consider something uh, alternative to that. And um, you know, our thought was that there's so much good work going on in, in our section um, with, with all our partners is how do we create a environment that will elevate all of that work and accelerate that work and um, uh, because it's going to be very hard to choose any one project to contribute to. And so uh, that's how we kind of designed the collaborative nature of this center is to uh, try to uh, achieve that goal of elevating everybody's work and uh, leveraging all the expertise and know-how that's already in existence here at Minneapolis Heart Institute. And uh, we uh, took the idea to uh, Dr. Hauser and Dr. Katsianis, and you know, they, they really said, you got to think big, um, just like Dr. Katsianis was told when he brought up the idea uh, for the Genetic Arrhythmia Center and the registry. So that really started the process. And uh, you know, in order to complement the clinical work that we do um, on a daily basis, we really do need uh, all these other additional dimensions uh, to impact and improve state-of-the-art patient care. And that's clinical research, quality improvement, education, and innovation. And, and all of that, again, is ongoing at, at, at Minneapolis Heart Institute uh, uh, with all of my partners. And um, we'll talk more about what they're uh, doing. And, uh, but what really is now uh, our goal is to marry that with the tremendous capacity and personnel at the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. And with that partnership, 
um, that's where we hope to truly advance the, the science uh, of heart rhythm um, disorders. So the goals were to create more efficient and effective research processes so we could scale clinical questions very quickly um, and give really each of our uh, section members uh, the opportunity to bring ideas uh, and then to identify an appropriate uh, funding for those investigative studies in a very uh, expedited manner and accelerate the development and uh, uh, expand on that work. And we're very fortunate that we have uh, partners across our uh, practice who are uh, leaders in their field in cardiovascular imaging, in valve science, in, in advanced heart failure uh, with the HDI. And so it really provides a tremendous opportunity for electrophysiology, which really lies at the crossroads, as you'll see later, um, to partner with those um, centers of excellence. And to uh, really, it's a two-way street so that we can grow our research production and also contribute to theirs. And then, as I mentioned, we want to leverage the expertise and the reputation that we have clinically and together integrate that with the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. And through that, accelerate that partnership and also attract multi-center studies, uh, novel alternative treatment strategies and innovation, both the big industry players as well as startups, and, and have those trials and uh, primary investigators here at Minneapolis Heart Institute run those um, studies and research uh, trials. So the, the organization is somewhat of an, a novel uh, proposal that we put forward, which is uh, truly a partnership uh, between me and the research leadership team at, at Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation, and that's with Don Witt and Sue Casey, who have a tremendous track record of uh, research publications, organizational development, um, and productivity. And, and so and, and, and a, an important part, I just want to focus on kind of a busy slide, but an important a part of this organization is the Strategic Advisory Board, which incorporates uh, the lead researchers and personnel from our organization. But we hope to attract um, thought leaders and mentors from other sister institutions and uh, major centers across the, the country, including Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic. And that organization serves as not just a way to adjudicate studies and, and provide guidance and, and promote the vision of the Science Center, but as a way to critically assess our performance and metrics and, 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 and tell us you know, if, if we're meeting the, the high standards we've set. And then uh, a lot of these functions are critical to the work that Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation does on a daily basis. But I wanted to get, bring particular attention to a couple areas one is this research advisory board. And really, every electrophysiologist in, in our section and our partners uh, uh, now at, at United, uh, we're all really one group now. And, and that incorporates every electrophysiologist, gives each person the, uh, the ability to promote, uh, advance, bring ideas, and um, be involved, in, whether it's an investigator-initiated study or an industry-sponsored trial. And so we hope to have widespread um, uh, contributions and, and, and people to take those responsibilities. And together, we've also identified, and th there's a precedent for this. Uh, so for many years, Dr. Hauser worked with Linda Kellinen in the, in the pacemaker clinic. As you know, our device clinic sees 25,000 patient visits every year. Tremendous amount of data and information, and along with the HDI, we need someone to coordinate that information. So we actually have a pacemaker nurse clinician, uh, Melanie Kappen in uh, medical informatics, who can be that bridge between our uh, database and, and the uh, information that we need to, and the patterns we need to recognize from that large data collection. And, 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 and people in the foundation uh, who specialize in that data collection and uh, analysis. So really, we want to put all the pieces together to create a system and environment that, like I said, scales up the work that we're doing and, and builds on that. And, Going forward, it's really something that we hope to do is contribute to um, EP education, have an EP fellowship, visiting scholars. A lot of that uh, will help facilitate this research, but also allow us to impart that knowledge and, and know-how to, to, to future generations. So, so really a broad um, vision that incorporates many aspects of uh, education, outreach, and research. And, Dr. Sharkey mentioned the three pillars. We, we uh, chose these uh, pillars very strategically um, because they're critical to the field of cardiac electrophysiology, but they're also areas in which 
um, we have tremendous expertise and and uh, productivity so far. And uh, sudden cardiac death prevention is is so important in the genetic arrhythmia center registry and our understanding of uh, conditions, particularly like arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, is going to be a centerpiece for that um, pillar. AFib ablation and management um, with Dr. Melby. Uh, much of the work and all the ablation work that we do on a regular basis um, it deserves to be highlighted and, and uh, uh, is a, a foundation for tremendous uh, improvement and you know one day hopefully curing atrial fibrillation. And of course, device safety research and innovation. And that's the pillar that we want, are going to concentrate on today. Uh, but as you see, as you know, Dr. Hauser, Dr. Gornick, Dr. Amquist, there's a tr Dr. Abdelhadi, there's a, there's a long uh, record, track record of research and innovation and safety issues that have been identified at Minneapolis Heart Institute, and we hope to build on that uh, as these devices become even more sophisticated and complex. So the areas that we'll need to gauge to see uh, uh, how we're proceeding uh, and how we're achieving are, are in these areas, research, education, and outreach. And um, these are our objectives, to increase enrollment, attract the latest studies and trials with cutting edge technology. Uh, we want to upgrade our ability to collect data, uh, uh, link with the HDI, and uh, analyze that information in large uh, uh, packets of data. We want to identify funding and resources for investigator-initiated uh, projects and really uh, enhance and in increase the productivity of that. And then uh, our success will be gauged by publications, presentations, and even intellectual property development and consulting, and something that's particularly um, unique to Minneapolis Heart Institute and, and where we're located in Minneapolis um, at the Center for uh, Cardiac Rhythm Device Technology. And then to incorporate all the areas from which we will obtain that data from the cardiac device clinic, the EP lab, clinical outcomes data, quality improvement, and coordinate with that with the appropriate staff. And then education is a critical part. Um, you know, in the past, there's again a precedent for these um, uh, seminars. Dr. Vaderat has run a seminar every year on lead extraction. That's uh, uh, internationally uh, recognized. Uh, people from around the country come to that. It's sponsored by Heart Rhythm Society. In the past, Dr. Hauser and Dr. Abdahadi have put together uh, Riata Leeds Summit uh, after the Riata, Riata Lead failures were identified. And so really building on that uh, with, uh, uh, in the, within these three pillars and having more of those uh, seminars and programs um, for uh, continuing medical education and imparting uh, that discussion uh, with institutions across the country and the world. And then having a, uh, increasing our national presence uh, in conferences, in professional organizations, a guideline in CPT committees. Um, that's already, Dr. Moore represents us uh, tremendously in many of these uh, areas, and we want to increase that uh, visibility of our practice um, uh, in, in the, around the world. And then outreach, uh, making this information available to patients so it improves their care. Um, community education and awareness events. This is something that the foundation does so well. And um, holding live workshops, seminars. So really, in all of these areas, this is how we'll kind of uh, assess and gauge our success. And it, this would not have been possible if it weren't for uh, catalysts in, in the organization that really took this uh, idea and inspiration and provided the mentorship and support. And, and that really, uh, we owe a lot of thanks to Dr. Hauser and Dr. Gornick. Uh, Dr. Sharkey and Dr. Fortman have been tremendously supportive in Ross in, in laying out the, the strategy and, and the vision um, Dr. Bank and Dr. Vaderat, just uh, some of our wonderful partners um, who, uh, with a tremendous group over at United, who will be part of this program. And then Dr. Abdadi and Dr. Katsianis, who provided um, a lot of that support and, um, and uh, wonderful um, uh, encouragement. And uh, Dr. Melby and Dr. Moore, who continue to do phenomenal work in their areas with AFib and quality improvement. And we've already have a all-star team that's been put together. And, and I'm sorry if I've left some names off, but the, uh, many people have been contributing to the, the uh, program and, and many more to come. And uh, Don, I mentioned Sue. Pam uh, leads the um, industry-sponsored uh, trials. Um, and we have a, lot of, a number of amazing technologies there. And I'll, I'll share one of those with you shortly. Um, Larissa is a statistician. Melanie, we mentioned in the pacemaker clinic. Elizabeth, Jesse, Jake, they've been involved with electro, uh, EP studies for a long a time, um, and it's been great to have them. So 
Today, you know, for the pillar that we want to focus on is really device safety, research, and innovation. And I wanted to kind of, this is proof uh, of concept of what we've talked about so far, the organization. Because within this pillar, you'll kind of see many of the ideas that we've laid out already have been in progress. You know, the, uh, our ability to look at databases and advisories uh, um, uh, at, through large databases is something that Dr. Hauser has done very well for many years. And um, again, the track record of identifying uh, when device safety issues arise uh, with the Medtronic Fidelis lead that was uh, prone to fracture and causing inappropriate shocks, the, Re the Riata lead manufactured by St. Jude Abbott uh, that was prone to failure, and, and many other uh, uh, cases, uh, situations like that that affected patient lives in a tremendous way were identified right here at Minneapolis Heart Institute. And so our goal going forward as these uh, cardiac rhythm devices become more sophisticated is to develop and maintain registries that track these outcomes and safety over time, but do that on a larger scale. And then uh, with that, uh, provide uh, surveillance and analysis and publications of that information to improve uh, patient safety. And um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you, you probably caught some of the uh, the grand rounds with Dr. The great grand rounds with Dr. Siraja and, and Dr. Zakeb. It kind of highlighted some of the extraction work that we're uh, doing in our in our uh, practice. Dr. Gornick and Dr. Vatterett have been involved with that for many years. Um, Dr. Zakeb uh, recently also he's been involved in a, a study uh, that's sponsored by Medtronic called the Leader Trial, which is based on a new next generation of four French leads, and we were the first in Minnesota. That's right, first in Minnesota to implant uh, that particular uh, lead and device in a patient. And then um, we'll talk a little bit here about leadless pacing in a, in a few minutes. And then I, uh, I uh, want to mention Dr. Bank, uh, his work uh, groundbreaking with device optimization. And there's a lot of uh, crossover between our work and heart failure now. Uh, because as uh, there are new de new devices in heart failure and contract cardiac contractility modulation that are implanted by electrophysiologists, and so our partnership with Dr. Samara and the heart failure, failure team and Dr. Ekman is going to be very critical going forward as well. So a lot of opportunities, a lot of potential. Um, this is kind of a show and tell slide, but this is a uh, a, a leadless uh, left ventricular electrode, and you can actually see the electrode that we've implanted inside the left ventricle here that has no wires, and it's, it has, it's essentially like a thumbtack with a little needle that pierces the endocardial surface of the heart. And this lead uh, electrode can sense the RV pacing from uh, any kind of lead that's in the right ventricle, whether it's a uh, regular lead or a micro pacemaker, and then wirelessly transmit that information and receive power with ultrasound technology to pace in the left ventricle. Uh, again, wireless biventricular pacing. Um, and so this is uh, part of the SOLVE CRT trial that we're involved with. Uh, but uh, an example of the type of complexity and next generation devices that are going to be out there that need to be monitored and, and closely followed to make sure uh, their safety uh, is, um, uh, is at par with uh, our standards. So um, one of the projects that uh, dealt with uh, device safety, I wanted to highlight is uh, a summer intern program, uh, project with Catherine Zhu uh, that was phenomenal. It's been accepted for uh, presentation at Heart Rhythm Society as well as uh, a manuscript that's uh, almost ready to submit. And this had to do with a, uh, a scare from industry, uh, actually from physicians who found that the newest um, medical device, or the newest electronic gadgets can interfere with cardiac rhythm devices. And um, pacemakers and defibrillators have a magnetic switch intrinsic to the device that allows us to handshake with the device and then make programming changes. And when you place a magnet over a device, uh, it changes, for pacemakers, it changes the, uh, uh, the pacing mode as well as the pacing rate. And for defibrillators, it actually suspends the device's ability to detect uh, ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, and uh, suspends shock therapy. And so you can see it's, it's useful for when a patient goes in to have surgery, for example, and they want to inactivate the defibrillator, they can just place a magnet over the device. Well, it turns out, and this is a commonly used magnet, this donut magnet that we use uh, in surgery or when we want to um, communicate and, and change uh, programming in the device. Well, it turns out uh, these uh, newer electronic gadgets, and iPhone 12 was really the first generation for Apple, uh, have a larger magnet inside them. 
And uh, that static magnetic field was strong enough, um, not only to click with accessories and enhance the charging capability of the phone, but you can imagine when someone potentially puts it over the device, it might have the ability to change the programming of a pacemaker or defibrillator. And if you're a patient and you see this article pop up, uh, that doesn't uh, convey a lot of confidence about your device, that the iPhone 12 will stop your implantable defibrillator. So this raised a lot of uh, uh, concerns across the industry. And um, you know, what better place to try to address this question than here in Minneapolis with, uh, with uh, our, our um, uh, collaborating with industry potentially to, to find answers that will answer this question and, and uh, really uh, provide data that may not be available anywhere else. And so the question was, is, is this MagSafe technology the start of new magnetic uh, uh, technology that's in many different electronic gadgets? not safe, or is the distance that's recommended by industry and Apple now of six inches uh, adequate to prevent interactions with uh, cardiac pacemakers and defibrillators? So our experiment goals were to establish the maximum static magnetic field of common electronic gadgets, and then to assess the interaction between these devices and uh, uh, pacemakers and defibrillators that we obtained from uh, Medtronic and Boston Scientific, and then determine the efficacy of the current guidelines. And uh, this was quite an interesting project. It's kind of where physics and engineering uh, meet medicine. And you can see on this table a number of different uh, uh, commonly used uh, electronic gadgets, uh, from iPhone to AirPods to Beats headphones, all of which emit a static uh, magnetic field. And here's a Gauss meter uh, that we're using to measure that static magnetic field from devices at varying distances. And, and with that, it's, it's important to remember it's not just iPhones uh, or the newest generation of iPhones, but rather all of these devices that can have a very strong magnetic field at the surface of the device in a particular orientation. And that has to do with the magnetic field density that's emitted from the device. And here is uh, the way we tested our uh, 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 experiment, uh, we have the device sitting in a industry standard uh, saline bath connected to a lead. And with the spacer, we're applying different types of devices over the uh, cardiac rhythm device. And we're assessing for a response from the cardiac rhythm device. Uh, are we able to trigger that magnet switch in the device? For pacemakers, we know that based on the change in pacing rate and pacing mode. For defibrillators, we know that based on an audible alert that's emitted from the device if that magnetic switch is triggered. And so what we found is that at the surface, all of these newer devices with the larger magnetic uh, field strength were able to initiate magnet mode uh, for most of the pacemakers and defibrillators that we tested. And, um, but as you get further away, and uh, particularly at 1.5 centimeters, which is, which is not a very significant distance, uh, then that interaction significantly drops off. And um, that is a critical uh, threshold. And uh, for industry, if, uh, and here uh, in, in terms of the measurement, 10 Gauss is equivalent to one millitesla. Uh, but you can see uh, 10 Gauss is really the, the industry standard that we don't, uh, that no device should interact with the magnetic field more than 10 Gauss. And as you get to, uh, or less than 10 Gauss, as you get to distances of 1.5 and 2 centimeters, that's when you start to notice that that, that uh, magnetic, static magnetic field is low enough that it's like, less likely to cause an interaction. And of course, we mentioned how the field density and orientation plays a role. But you can see at the surface that that uh, magnetic field is quite strong. So it does turn out that the newer generation has a significantly stronger magnetic field than prior iPhones. So the 10R, for example, uh, was not able to uh, elicit magnet mode in our devices. Um, the interference distance is consistent with the boundaries set by industry standards. And no device-device -device interaction, based on our analysis, would be anticipated at six inches. And that is the Apple and industry uh, standard, given that the magnetic field decreases based on the inverse square of the distance. And the key takeaway, as you can imagine, all the, uh, the calls that we received from the pacemaker clinic about uh, patients with these devices, is that electronic products should not be worn on the same side as an implantable uh, device. And even more, uh, that would be the recommendation now, like, for example, in your coat pocket in winter. 
and direct contact with the skin over an implanted device should be avoided. Uh, but six inches uh, is, is a reasonable distance. And uh, this was uh, uh, the team that, that uh, we were able to have the fortune to work with. So this, these are a group of engineers from, uh, and, and uh, representatives from both Medtronic and Boston Scientific. And they all had one request in order for us to work together, and that is that we had to work in a neutral location without home field advantage for either Medtronic or Boston Scientific. But, but with that, um, uh, uh, that uh, here at the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation provided that very nice uh, um, environment for, which, uh, for us to do this work. And of course, that's Catherine there uh, who led the project uh, this past summer. And um, uh, Dave, uh, Neil, Joel, uh, Jim, Andrew, and um, uh, uh, um, Wyatt um, were tremendous. They've been involved in this type of work, engineering with um, devices uh, for many, many years at their respective companies. So um, the next part, I, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Hauser, who has really put uh, interventional electrophysiology at the crossroads of his career all his life. And actually, this article um, uh, and uh, editorial is the, the first uh, paper that was published as part of the Heart Rhythm Science Center and um, shows how interventional electrophysiology is really a, a critical piece to um, our work as cardiologists and, and our care of patients. And um, what, I just wanted to kind of share the story. So I, I went to HRS in, in um, San Francisco, and uh, I expected to see Dr. Hauser there. After all, he is the uh, former president uh, of what is now Heart Rhythm Society, except that when I went there, he was 30 feet taller than everybody else <laughs> at, the, at, the, at, the, at the meeting. And uh, this was uh, one of the pictures that was there uh, at, the, at one of the industry um, um, uh, sites with the pioneers in electrophysiology. So I really do want to th thank him for his mentorship and um, really the uh, collaborative nature and inclusive nature of this uh, um, science center uh, has a lot to do with uh, his mentorship. So I, uh, without further ado, I'd want to introduce Dr. Hauser. Jay, if you ever decide not to be an electrophysiologist, you can go into PR. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful, undeserved introduction. Uh, as uh, most of you know, I, uh, I've spent 20 years looking at device reliability. And uh, what's unique about <clears throat> this current problem is it's no longer a matter of devices breaking, like leads fracturing or insulation failures or batteries failing prematurely. This is uh, more of a design and, frankly, an operator problem. We're going to talk about leadless pacemaker perforations. And um, I think I've got about 20 minutes. Is that, is that fair to say? So the potential benefits of a leadless pacemaker are fairly obvious. Uh, without a transvenous lead, you're not going to have the conductor fractures, insulation breaks venous occlusion and interference with the tricuspid valve function. Uh, there's no pacemaker pocket, so you're not going to have a hematoma, an infection, and the patient's not going to complain of pocket discomfort. And importantly, in this day and age of structural heart disease, uh, they will not interfere with transcatheter valve therapies on the right side of the heart. Uh, every company will have a leadless pacemaker. The only one that's currently available uh, on the market is the Medtronic Micro Pacemaker. It's a single chamber VVI pacemaker. It all, they also have a AV pacemaker that detects atrial contraction and paces in the ventricle uh, more or less synchronously. Uh, the first implant of a dual chamber leadless pacemaker occurred several weeks ago. I believe this was in Europe and this is an Abbott device. And we can look forward over the next uh, decade to uh, the implementation of leadless pacing in all chambers. So we'll have single chamber ventricular, dual chamber, uh, and CRT devices. And then they are combining uh, the uh, subcutaneous ICD as well as a right ventricular pacemaker, leadless pacemaker for uh, pacing and sensing in the ventricle. Now, the implantation uh, is from the uh, femoral approach, and a um, delivery catheter loaded with the 
pacemaker is introduced across the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Initially, they implanted the device in the right ventricular apex, but now it should be in the septum for reasons which I'll allude to in a minute. Uh, the device is fixated, the micro device is fixated using nitinol tines that grasp the myocardium. One of the problems with this particular device is that you can't measure thresholds until you actually deploy the tines and fixate it to the uh, myocardium. Uh, you can retrieve the device if the thresholds are not adequate, bring it back into the delivery system and find a different location. So the device underwent a clinical trial and it was published in the England Journal of Medicine in 2016. It was non-randomized. There were 725 micro patients implanted at 56 centers and compared to a 2,600 patient historical control group. Uh, there was a high uh, success rate and only six patients were not implanted, but three of those had perforations and one had a pericardial effusion. Uh, the early data demonstrated that compared to the historical control, there were indeed fewer complications in the microgroup compared to the transvenous group. There were uh, 28 complications and 25 patients. 39% of these complications were traumatic cardiac injury, namely cardiac perforation or effusion. So that overall 1.6% of patients in this trial had a cardiac perforation. A real-world registry was then maintained and the results were published in 2018. Again, they demonstrated that there were fewer uh, lead-related complications in the microgroup, as you would expect. But there were 14 total perforation or effusion events. Eight patients required a pericardiocentesis. Two patients required open-heart surgery and died. The open heart surgery was done to repair a perforation. Now, if you look at the data, comparing the micro to the transvenous historical control group, the one thing that jumped out to me was there were five deaths in the micro group. There were no deaths in the historical control group. And I can say in 47 years of practice, I don't recall a single patient ever dying during or after a right ventricular single chamber pacemaker implantation, not a single one. And if you look at the textbooks, the textbooks say that tamponade is almost unheard of with a transvenous right ventricular implant. Now, the Mayo Clinic published their experience on 90 pacemaker implants. They had a 100% implant success. And the only major complication was a pocket hematoma requiring some evacuation. There was no acute perforation. Uh, at the Emory group, uh, a highly experienced group, 302 patients under one implant. There was only one tamponade treated with a pericardiocentesis, no deaths. 23 micros were abandoned primarily because of pacing-induced cardiomyopathy and also elevation and threshold. So this is where we were in December of 2020. While gathering uh, data for another study, we found that uh, there appeared to be an unusual number of microimplant deaths in the FDA MOD database. So we used the online MOD keyword search tool, and we used the keywords death, tamponade, and perforation to search the database. And we compared the micro to the capture fix transvenous lead. The capture fix is manufactured by Medtronic. And what we found uh, was uh, very concerning. We found 96 deaths in the micro group, 23 deaths in the capture fix group, and frankly, I was surprised to see the 23 deaths in the capture group, capture fix group. There were um, 287 tamponades in the micro group, 225 in the capture group, but significantly more in the micro group, and um, more micro patients required rescue thoracotomy to uh, repair a perforation. Now, once we finished this study, I, and I swear this was two weeks later, Tom Gunderson, uh, former chairman of the board here, introduced me to Basil Systems Software. And Basil Systems Software searches the MOD database and looks in the crannies and corners for 
uh, reports that didn't make it into the database identified by the mod search tool. So we uh, compared the two search tools, and interestingly enough, using the Bazel search engine, we found that our previous study had uh, uh, not found 125 events, and in fact, the number of deaths increased by 50%. So we went back to the drawing board using the Bazel search system, and we now found 563 microperforations that occurred during 30 days after implant. 563 perforations. Those 563 perforations resulted in cardiac tamponade in 89% of patients. Most of those occurred during implant. Many of them had cardiac arrest, shock, hypotension, 29% underwent emergency surgery. Some patients developed a pericardial effusion, 64 or just 11%. Overall, there were 150 deaths from these 563 microperforations. That's 27% of the cohort. So what are the factors associated with perforation? Well, we know from a previous study that it commonly occurred in patients who were frail, elderly, and female, and who had COPD. So uh, these were your grandmothers. Our study showed that a significant factor was the need to recapture the device, to redeploy it, to reposition or refixate it. And this commonly occurred because the thresholds, the electrical parameters were unacceptable or that the fixation was incomplete and in fact some uh, devices dislodged and went into the pulmonary artery and needed to be snared. And others caused arrhythmias or interfered with tricuspid valve function. We also found a significant number of operator errors. Operator errors included implanting the device on the free wall of the right ventricle and uh, using the introducer or delivery system uh, in such a way that it resulted in perforation. And the question that we had at the end of this was, is there an implanting center issue? Operator training and experience, CV surgery backup, or other facilities? So through uh, 2021, uh, there have been 784 microperforations and 185 perforation-related deaths. That's 24%. 64% of these deaths occurred in the United States. So this is not a problem from Europe or Asia or wherever. And when we drill down on the U.S. microperforation and deaths data, we see an interesting phenomenon. Beginning in around mid-2020, uh, there is an acceleration in the number of perforations. More concerning, what we saw in 2021 is, not only is there an increase in the number of perforations, the mortality rate associated with perforations went from 22% to 38%. And let's go back to this previous slide. And if we look up here, beginning in around mid-2020, mid-2020, we see an acceleration in the number of adverse events. And why is this happening? The short answer is, I don't know, but I can suspect what might be happening. And we'll talk about that in a moment. We also should note that perforation is not confined just to the Medtronic device. In fact, the Abbott NanoStim device had perforations and deaths. And the latest device uh, recently was reported, this is called the Avair. Uh, there was a 200 patient trial. There were uh, two patients who required sternotomy. And Bill Katsianis, when I showed him the data, said, well, that's a 1% sternotomy rate <laughs> for this trial. So in summary, historical and contemporaneous but non-randomized data suggest that leadless pacemakers have fewer complications than transvenous pacemakers. Studies from experienced centers, including ours, show that the vast majority of micro-leadless pacemakers can be implanted without complication. The incidence of leadless cardiac perforation appears to be about 1%, maybe a little less. 
However, unlike transvenous lead perforation, leadless pacemaker perforations may be large and result in acute cardiac tamponade and death. Therefore, leadless pacemaker insertion should be confined to centers capable of managing implant complications. And I can tell you that today that is not the case. What's happened over the past 12 to 18 months is these devices are being implanted all over the place. Community hospitals, hospitals where there's no surgeon available should there be a significant perforation. Furthermore, we don't know the qualifications of the operators in these hospitals. So perforation mortality is increasing in the United States, possibly due to the dispersion of implants to less qualified centers. Thank you. We have time for questions. This is uh, outstanding, uh, Rob, and, and congratulations also, Jay, for you know the, the vision of the center and excited to the partnership. To your uh, last point, uh, Dr. Howes, uh, how things should change, you know, now that we have, you know, we're starting to raise the concern uh, and we're starting to implant it to the left ventricle now, which is a bit thicker, but how could we improve um, these numbers? Well, unfortunately, um, Electrophysiology is behind the structural heart people. What the structural heart people have done is put together registries. So there's a transcatheter valve registry. And uh, in fact, the transcatheter valve registry published a paper in Jack last summer about the dispersion of TAVR uh, throughout the community. And what they were able to show very alarmingly is that TAVR mortality is going up. And they related mortality strictly to the volume in the centers. So we know that um, devices are being implanted in centers that probably shouldn't be doing it. And we know that in those centers, there is not the capability that we have, for example, the Minneapolis Heart Institute. I mean, we have a fantastic imaging facility and we have a great surgical team and all the, all the things that you need to treat a complication. And not only that, but we have operators who have huge experiences, high volume. So we're dealing with, with two worlds, and I'm, I'm afraid that there's a dark side that we don't know about, and we're not going to get at it until we have the registry. Every, every, every implant whether it's a pacemaker or whatever, tab or whatever, every implant should go on a registry in this country. And at some point in time, we can then figure out where things should not be done and figure out ways to, to address that. But great question. What do you think, Jay? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we have to find a way to collect that data. We have to get, get it from the centers where these issues are, are happening. And so... Uh, it's, it's a challenge, but that's one of the proposals that we have is to establish that leadless registry and, and to get uh, buy-in from uh, places around Minnesota, around the country. And, uh, but it, it's a challenge because uh, as you can focus on the largest high volume centers and you won't see the signal. And it was really when Dr. Hauser looked at the law database and found these perforations. And as you know, uh, there's now been 100,000 implants of the micro device. And you can imagine, you know, uh, how, wh where those problems happening, we just, we don't know exactly what the data shows, and that's what we need to find. Um, thanks for both of you for that great and inspiring talk. Can you talk to the engineers about the shape of this device? Because it's like a bullet when I look at it, and I'm wondering if, if there's a design flaw here with respect to yeah. that, or is there, if, I mean, just what are your thoughts about the yeah, the time. It's, it's really a great point, Dr. Sharkey. It, it's probably a lot also to do with how it's delivered. The, the delivery system and the apparatus is, is, is pretty bulky, it's cumbersome, and it does require a learning curve. And so uh, that is going to be, for the micro at least, that seems to be a big part of, of the perforation aspect. For the other device, 
it, it could be something different. It could be the fixation mechanism. And so it, it's variable depending on the technology and the type of device. And that's also something we have to kind of tease, tease apart the, depending on the device and the, and the location to operate. And, and the ones in the left ventricle, are they of similar um, design? So it's a, it's a very different design. And uh, uh, I'll tell you from our experience so far implanting one of those and, and our partners at, at United, it's very cumbersome, very challenging right. to implant that device. So it's not something that's ready for uh, mainstream uh, prime time use. And um, uh, that is a, a, a separate but challenging, uh, uh, it, it, the technology is fantastic. The potential is there, but the, the ability to do it safety, safely and make sure that patients derive that benefit without complication is, is gonna be critical and something that we need to be at the forefront of. I, I think another, big problem is um, we need to visualize the right ventricle better. Uh, uh, Pierce Vatterot does RV grams in uh, two views. And so he understands the anatomy of the right ventricle. Uh, we, we had a case where a micro was uh, implanted and one of the tines got the uh, septal pap papillary muscle and caused a severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So we, we need to know the geography of the right ventricle better than we do now. Right now, and, and you, you say, well, that's such an obvious thing to do, but it's not being done uh, by most people. It's just a blind go in. The other thing they're doing is they're implanting the micro and then they're doing an AV node ablation because most of these patients have atrial fibrillation. And so you can see that we now have two things that can go wrong. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in the tricuspid yeah. valve. You know, the right ventricle has been underappreciated for, for a long time. And with more leads across the, the, uh, the tricuspid annulus with these newer devices, clearly that imaging aspect is going to be critical to understanding that. Yeah. And that's another aspect the operator experience to, to put the device in the right spot, not just the, the, uh, the mm -hmm. delivery sheets, but to make sure that they're getting. Because if you put the micro on the septum, you're not going to perforate. But when, when you're not able to get the device where you want it to be, or you're not sure of where you are in the right ventricle, that's where you're going to run into issues. And a lot of these uh, tricuspid transcatheter valve replacement devices, which are bulkier, yeah. Yeah, they are being anchored by oversizing. So you push the tricuspid annulus and then the membrane the septum, and therefore the pacemaker. So it's about 12%. And some of them put the valve, they complete the AV block, and they go through the valve and put a micro. Uh, you know, it would be better for us to have a mechanism that we can predict, you know, both right. from the design of the valve itself, but also yeah. anticipate that. We have just one online question that comes from Dr. Lesser, which also has to do with pre-op imaging, and he asks, uh, do you think that there's any other pre-op imaging approaches that would help? Yeah, I think uh, C CT, and, you know, uh, it's a, it's really great. Many of our patients, imaging is so pervasive that we can oftentimes find uh, CT or MRI and we can somewhat plan uh, the implant procedure. But in order to really make that uh, mainstream, you know, we, we do that very well at our institution, but there really has to be a link between that image uh, from, from the screen and what's happening in the ET lab. And, and that technology, that, that interface is gonna be important, whether or not it's planning, with, with certain angles and or whether it's another technology in, in between that, that bridges that gap, such as uh, venograms or uh, RV grams or uh, ultrasound imaging or importing that image into the EP lab. And that's really uh, an area of uh, a lot of interest and, and something we can be part of. Thank you. What are your thoughts about the, uh, the dual chamber uh, 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 doing to this uh, can imagine. Well, yeah, you know, we went through the Watchman experience, and you know, Watchman had a one percent perforation rate. Uh, the 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 new Flex is doing doing better, but this is going to be. Uh, uh, I hope they're all done in a place where they've got a surgeon standing by. Yeah, that's a critical piece of Dr. Helder's data is that when there is a perforation. It's it's usually catastrophic, and uh, that's the that's the whole key is to try what try to avoid that situation. And again, for a standard transvenous pacemaker, and now we're doing predominantly conduction casing leads mm -hmm. in the right ventricular septum. 
that that is almost unheard of. So so for a pacemaker, is it you know, uh, this is quite remarkable data. Can you share with us how you stumbled on this? Oh, you know, when when you're retired, you don't have anything else. To do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll tell you. I'll tell you how I started. We 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 published a paper on the reliability of implantable defibrillators, and we got the data from the uh, product performance reports that each manufacturer publishes twice a year, or about twice a year. So I started out, and I wanted to do this for 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 pacemakers. So I started out. Uh, with, with the Medtronic devices, and I just got into mod looking at stuff, and you know, I just stumbled on these deaths, and that's how it, that's how it began. Great. 